A tale of two unions. Canadian auto workers make a deal while one remains out of reach in the U.S. A new poll shows a worrisome number of young people in Michigan ready to bolt. And after 10 years in the D, what has J.P. Morgan Chase learned about what it takes to make a city go? Today is Sunday, September 24th, 2023, and this is Flashpoint. Hi, welcome to Flashpoint. Over our more than 25 years on the air with this program, we have long focused on where we've been, where we are, or where we're headed. Well, this morning, we're gonna look at all three in the same program. Where we've been? Well, 10 years ago, J.P. Morgan Chase came to the city with a commitment of $200 million to try to help guide Detroit out of bankruptcy and into an age of recovery and revitalization. Marking the 10 years, CEO Jamie Dimon drew a lot of attention for suggesting Mayor Duggan should now run for president. But I want to know more about what we're learning about what works and what doesn't. We are going to talk about that ahead this morning. We're also going to talk about where we're headed, which was the subject of a new poll commissioned by the Detroit Regional chamber. Young people don't sound all that wedded to sticking around in Michigan. That's a problem we'll talk about too. And as for where we are, well, we're in the middle of a nasty strike that is expanding and starting to affect people who have no seat at the bargaining table at all. And why were Canadian auto workers able to reach a deal? It's all today on Flashpoint. Let's start with the UAW strike. Sean Fain turning up the heat again on Friday with about three dozen more plants now added to the strike mix, notably using his ammo on General Motors and Stellantis, but not Ford, which he singled out for progress. Let's talk about it with Stephen Henderson, host of Detroit Today on WDET. Kurt Nagel is with us, the auto reporter for Cranes Detroit Business, and Glenn Stevens is the executive director of Mish Auto. And Glenn, let me start with you. Before we get to the substance of Sean Fain's announcement and the expansion of the strike, Thursday night, Daniel Howes, the Detroit News reported, came across this conversation going on on social media that really exposed the UAW strategy. I'm not sure it was a surprise exactly what they're trying to do, but not a good look to have it talked about and exposed, is it? Well, not a good look. Uh, labor and these companies built Michigan. They built their economy. They're very important to be unified. We've had disagreements in the past. You know, I, I think that this class warfare, uh, guerrilla warfare type of thing is, doesn't go over real well. Our hope is that it just gets settled so we can get back to work because we lead the industry. We want to keep leading the industry. But the here threat to bleed the automakers for a few months not a good was look. a little bit of a startle, a little jarring, wasn't it? It was. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, uh, Cranes reported this week that this, just in the first week, has cost the American economy over one and a half billion dollars. It's going to certainly be more now, isn't mm -hmm. it? Yeah, absolutely, uh, especially with the announcements today um, on the striking of the parts depots. I think we saw the supply base take a collective sigh of relief, knowing that they weren't the targets, but now we have dealerships who are worried about whether or not they can uh, obtain parts and service vehicles now. What's your take on Canada, uh, Canada reaching an agreement with Ford, doing it the old-fashioned way, patterned bargaining, and nothing happening here yet? We don't know the, all the details yet in the, in the Canadian agreement, but interesting compare and contrast. Yeah, it? absolutely. One side has a deal, the other side doesn't. So we'll see how it plays out. If it plays out in, uh, um, in Sean Fain's favor, uh, if that tactic is uh, beneficial for him. He remains pugilistic, Stephen, as we saw on Friday, but I, at, at what point do you, is there a danger that the UAW overplays its hand? He says that po polling is showing that the American public right now is behind the union. I think he's right, uh, because I think that the issues that they're talking about here resonate with people in many different industries and in many different places in the country. I also think that the automaker's behavior over the last decade uh, has kind of courted uh, this kind of response from the union. If you look at what Marion Barra made in 2015, it was about $14 million. Mm -hmm. uh, last year, she made almost $30 million. At the same time, uh, the entry pay for people in the industry has dropped over the last 20 years from $19 to $18. I don't know how you justify that, given the success that the industry's had in the last decade coming out of the bankruptcies. Uh, they're not sharing the good fortune uh, that they're having with the people who do the work. That's what this is about. And uh, a strike may not be 
the most productive way to get it. But it's, it's like in politics, it's like war is negotiations by other means. Mm. Uh, <laughs> there are going to be some casualties. And uh, I don't know what else the union could do to make this point. Let me let you both weigh in on this uh, this executive compensation being uh, kind of a glaring. It's, it's really, it, it I think that one plays really well with the public. And yet, if we took all of what Mary Barra made and then spread it among, <laughs> you know, it's not a whole lot in the, in the, in the, the sum total, but boy, the optics, Glenn, are tough. Well, the, the, and this is part of uh, the back and forth. Um, I think that, yes, you're right, the American public would feel that way, but it's hard to tell the 650 people in Detroit that got laid off last week mm -hmm just started I was in that plant recently mm -hmm. they just started that plant mm -hmm. there was a lot of excitement they're building seats for the Broncos and those people are all of a sudden out of work so to them the, it, they look at it differently talk to an executive on the west side of the state all their salaried employees plus the plant employees one week off for the rest of the year because they got to make up for that revenue they've lost so the impact of the economy is really really key here and it can't extend it just cannot extend too much carnage will come Kurt, it's always interesting to watch the executives deal with this question about what they make. Uh, mm -hmm. Nobody turns down money. I, I fully understand that. But this is really a tough one for them. Yeah, absolutely. I think what is really um, at play here is the transition to electric vehicles. It's going to be a very expensive pursuit. Uh, Tesla already has a head start. The, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the transplant automakers are knocking at the door for market share. We've got Chinese domestic OEMs that are fast rising. Um, and the OEMs can't have a uh, labor costs that are prohibitive. Um, they can't, uh, if, if, if they pay that much in labor, then they're going to have to absorb the cost some way. They're going to have to pass it on to the consumer, but new cars are expensive, electric vehicles are very expensive, and as Glenn and I have talked about, the supply base doesn't really have a whole lot more to give. So this is this is really this is what really what some people are arguing, Stephen, is that we're arguing over four or five years because after that the gig think, is up. I think that's right, and I think um, uh, you got to look at this in a number of different ways. One is what does the union need? What do workers need uh, in this economy? What do the companies need to do to make sure they can employ the workers uh, in the future? And how do you settle this dispute? There are, there are no absolute rights or wrongs in terms of the answers here. But I keep coming back to the question of uh, what should the union do? What is the, what is the alternative to what they're doing to make the point that they're trying to make? Uh, this is what this is what uh, the, the the labor landscape offers them is uh, the opportunity to say we will not work until uh, the conditions in the pay are fair and and the companies are going to have to figure out a way to. But, to but make are that we happen. ignoring what what Kurt just laid out? What the, the reality of Tesla, the reality of electrification, the reality of what foreign automakers. So we faced you know, a similar situation to this uh, years ago in the newspaper strike here yes. in, in Detroit, right? Uh, when we went out, um, it was on the precipice of the digital explosion and the erosion of, of classified advertising and things like that. Um, we got caught up in, in the middle of that transition. It didn't turn out well for either side. That's a strike that went on for years. I would hope yep. that uh, these two uh, combatants can can solve things earlier and, and figure out a better future. And somehow we still have two papers. Yeah, well, <laughs> we do. <laughs> uh, Glenn, uh, the, the singling out of Ford as being uh, a little bit more uh, conducive to agreement and a little bit more giving, does that really tell us where the landscape is here? Can you see a moment where Ford really has a much more beneficial contract to the UAW than the other two would be willing to give? I, I don't think so. I think things will level out. Um, I think in Canada we're seeing it proceed like it normally did in a pattern way. Right. Clearly there's some progress being made here. But just to echo what P, uh, you know, Stephen's saying, you know, we have to have a better wage and a better life for these workers. Nobody argues that they should have an increase. Mm -hmm. But we still have to compete on an international and a national stage. We are not operating an American car bubble anymore. And that's really important. So we have to figure out this together, really for the health of Michigan's economy for the future, as well as the industry itself and the life of the UAW and these companies. Kurt, the long term here, um, if we look at uh, a lot of economists are baffled as to how the U.S. has stayed out of a recession. But now we start looking at something like this strike going on maybe for months, if you believe the way that, the, that this was worded. 
may be a government shutdown coming as well. I already mentioned the billion and a half this is costing. What's the long-term prognosis that all this starts to add up to? Well, it really depends. I mean, right now the uh, the dealers that were the target of the the latest strike, mm -hmm. they've got parts inventories that are going to take them for at least a week because the OEMs built up those inventories right. in anticipation of this. We have suppliers that are still running. Um, to Glenn's point, the uh, seating supplier for the Bronco had the layoffs, but that's because they supplied directly to a plant that was shut down. Right. So right now the damage is minimal. Uh, and then to Steve's point, uh, there's a lot of support for the strike right now, um, but if it continues and there's more layoffs and there's more people out of work, they might start adjusting their uh, opinion of it. It feels like where we're headed this week, that's for sure. Thanks so much for the conversation, guys. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Uh, we will continue. This is Flashpoint on Local 4. Don't go away. Last week, the leaders of J.P. Morgan Chase, including Chief Jamie Dimon, were in town, marking 10 years since Chase made a massive post-bankruptcy commitment to the city. In a way, Detroit was a kind of laboratory for Chase. What was possible? What could the nation's largest bank do in a struggling but vitally important American city? Very glad to have with me Peter Schur, the vice president, or vice chairman, rather, of uh, J.P. Morgan Chase. Peter, I so appreciate the time. I, and let me, I want to dispense with something at the very outset, because some would ask, what's the angle here? What is in this for Chase? But you and Jamie Dimon have said uh, often and plainly that you believe investing in communities is good for business. Well, and, and uh, first of all, thank you for having me. Sure. And it, uh, this is a great example of why investing in, in communities is good for business. Jamie Dimon called me about 10 years, literally 10 years ago this month, September of 2013. I was sitting in my office in New York, and he said, I want you to go out to Detroit and see if there's anything we can do to help. You know, the city had entered bankruptcy two months early, the single largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the, of the country. Yep. Unemployment was at records high. You know, it was not a good picture at the time. But when I showed up in the city, so this is, you know, end of September, early October of 2013, I saw a very different picture. I saw the community had come together, leaders had come together, the Kresge Foundation working with others had created the Detroit Future City Plan. You know, there was a sense that the, the leaders across the community had said enough. We, we can't rewrite the past, but we can we can write our future. And we thought we could help. We didn't think we could come in here, here a bunch of guys from Wall Street who want to tell you what to do. <laughs> but we thought when, when, when a city comes together, we thought there were things we could do in some areas to help accelerate and catalyze some of the growth that the city wanted to undertake. There, there, there are a lot of struggling cities in America, especially a lot of those that were at the vanguard of the Industrial Revolution in the U.S. Do you feel like Detroit is similar in that way, or given what you just described, is there something different about Detroit? Well, it's interesting. Detroit was one of the last big industrial cities that didn't come back. You know, you saw Cleveland and Pittsburgh and others, right. and I think there were you know, for a long time, if you look back at the history, I think there were a lot of leaders just kicking the can, hoping that there would be some, you know, uh, resolution. And I think bankruptcy was a was was in many ways a defining moment for the city, and and the recognition that if if things were going to change, it wasn't going to be because Washington, and it wasn't going to be because a bunch of bankers and finance people. It was because the city had decided. So I think in many ways what you know the the circumstances that led to d the challenges that detroit saw were not unique i think the comeback was very unique and i yeah. think in many ways it's a role it's the it's the model that we now apply when we are looking at how we could help cities not just around the country but around the world and really the key thing as as the city come together and the leaders across the community putting aside the partisanship and putting aside the division and not worrying about blaming how they got there, but really focusing on the, the, the particular needs of the community, housing, access to capital for entrepreneurs, how to get more people into the banking system, how to deal with workforce skills to attract companies. Yeah. And you know, you've got a mayor there and Mayor Duggan who systematically took on every one of those issues and gained confidence 
that this was a place you could invest and grow uh, and ultimately make money. Well, I know Chase has felt like they've had a real partner there. That, in fact, that led to the headline this past week of Jamie Dimon suggesting Mayor Duggan ought to think about the White House. Uh, but I'm really, uh, the, the using, you seeing Detroit now as your model for what Chase has done here, that's why I was so excited to talk to you. What have you decided uh, works and what have you decided is not a great way to get involved and try to help uh, a, a, an, an urban, uh, a very important urban landscape? Well, what doesn't work is is a bank or the federal government or someone from outside coming in and trying to impose our our ideas on what the city should do. Ultimately, those decisions have to be made within the city. Collaboration works. And in too many cities, and frankly, after we first made the investment in Detroit, we're feeling good about it. You know, Jamie and others said, well, are there other places we could do this? And you would be surprised. A lot of places we would go, you couldn't really tell you know, who were the people who were really driving decision making and everyone had their own idea mm. and there was a lack of uh, cohesion. The yeah. other thing that we learned really importantly, money is not going to fix these problems on its own. That, you know, if listen, if you looked at the 20 years, you know, before 2013, when Detroit went into bankruptcy, there were hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars that went into the city. And things just kept getting worse. And and so the leadership willing to this to make tough decisions. And for us, one of the things we recognized was if we're going to make investments, we had to bring expertise in to help support that investment. So we created this program called the Service Corps, where we brought over the last 10 years over 185 of our of leaders, leading JP Morgan bankers, finance people, technology people, data people, HR people from 15 different countries. They came to Detroit three or four weeks at a time to work with, you know, Eastern Market and work with Detroit at Work and work with a number of the organizations there on the ground, the, the land bank when it first started, to help bring the expertise and do planning. So if you think writing a big check alone is going to solve a problem, yeah. it won't. You really need to have the planning and, and connectivity. Uh, Peter, I've only got about half a minute left, but I also wanted to make sure that I ask you what you think the pandemic did. It obviously, it, it stopped all American cities kind of in their tracks, but it was right in the middle of this resurgence in Detroit. Uh, listen, I think had this, the leadership of the city, and I, and I don't mean just the, the political leadership and Mayor Duggan, but the business leadership, the community, I think if they had not created over the five or six years before the pandemic, that level of trust, I think things would have been so much more worse, so much worse for uh -huh. Detroit. And the fact is, Detroit has fared better. I work with cities all over the world. Detroit has fared better than most other cities coming through the pandemic and, and being on its feet. And so I think Detroit has a lot to be proud of in terms of how it, it took on that challenge uh, and was so resilient. That's 10 years and counting, so on we go. Uh, Peter, thank you so very much for the time. Fascinating stuff, and I look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Devin. Go Lions. Yeah, exactly right. Later today against Atlanta. We'll take a quick break. Back with more in just a minute on Flashpoint. Lastly, this morning, we've talked so much about brain drain on this program, the efforts to keep our best and brightest from fleeing the mitten. Well, a new poll commissioned by the Detroit Regional Chamber sought to see just how big of a problem it is post-pandemic. And the findings have been getting a lot of attention this week. The pollster for the chamber is the same as our pollster here at Local 4, Richard Zuba of the Glenn Gariff Group. Uh, Richard, I, I, I guess there's a couple of ways to look at this, trying to decide which is the wiser way to look at your findings, that a third of young Michiganders figure they'll be leaving or that two thirds figure they'll be staying? <laughs> well, I think we need to look at this one third and the fact that they, they aren't saying they are leaving, they are saying they are open to leaving yep. Michigan. And I think that should worry everybody. But the, when you start to drill down and look at the things that they're, the issues that they have with Michigan, number one was the weather. I, I, we can't do anything about that. No, we can't. Actually, I was surprised that the weather is not as big of an issue uh, <laughs> as, as we might have thought it would be. You know, there, you know, when we ranked 12 different factors, the weather came in the sec second lowest of those 12 as a deciding factor. 
but well, there were far bigger issues that were at play for them. In fact, we're hoping that our weather long term continues to make us sort of a, you know, a, a climate, a place for climate refugees, I guess. Um, but talk about what, what do you think? What was your takeaway? What does Michigan need to be doing to become a more attractive landing and staying point for these young people? Well, I think what we see in these numbers are, if we think of a three-legged stool, leg one is they need good opportunities. They need jobs availability, they need good pay. Leg two, these young people are saying, do the basics right. Make sure that there's affordable housing, there's low crime. Surprisingly, one, one thing that did jump out at me is how many, how many of them say, make sure the roads are fixed. Yeah. You know, do things right. And then the third, our quality of life uh, and who you talk to depends on how they define quality of life. But for example, with college graduates or those seeking a college degree, those social issues we hear so much about are really important, particularly to women. And I don't think you can talk about any one of these individually. You have to be talking about all three of them. And I don't see anybody doing that on either side of the aisle, acknowledging that all three are important. Yeah, really interesting. And in fact, when we look at the places with whom Michigan is competing, states like Texas, uh, you would figure that already these, the, the, the issues you're talking about, these social issues, uh, already should be looking um, maybe more friendly to, in Michigan than they are to in other places that have been kind of hot, shouldn't they? Well, you know, it's interesting. We ask in three s series of questions, if you had a similar job offer, would you choose Michigan or Texas, yep. Michigan or California, Michigan or Chicago? And we see some big differences in this, in that, for example, Texas is much more attractive to those without a college degree. But of those three choices, Texas was the least attractive to college graduates. Mm. Yeah, really Chicago, interesting. Chicago, conversely, was the least attractive to those without a college degree and the most attractive to college graduates. Yeah, interesting. And, the, the, yeah, and I, when we ask why, they give very clear reasons for Texas being, you know, a lower cost state to them versus Chicago being a big city that's inclusive. Yeah. Lastly, Richard, one of the other things that I think you don't believe people are talking about enough uh, is the importance of immigration in a state like Michigan. You know, if you look at Michigan's history, Michigan's successes have been based on waves of immigrants coming into this state. And what we're talking about here is very much about migration within the United States. We don't have any immigrants coming into this country, particularly to Michigan. Uh, we have them rolling over the southern border right now to the southwestern Sunbelt states. And the question is, are they helping drive the success of those states? Yeah. As much as people are angry and it's a divisive issue. You know, you look at how Michigan was settled, the Finns in the UP, the waves of Eastern Europeans coming in, the migration from the South yeah. of black Americans. I These were all, you know, waves of people that helped generate, you know, fuel for Michigan's economy. Sh should we be talking about this? Yeah that we need more people coming into this state, not just from the US, for, but from abroad. And what are the pipelines to do that? Uh, this is all very, I mean, this is, these are absolutely existential matters uh, for, for the state of Michigan to be considering. It's fascinating stuff, Richard. I so appreciate, as always, your expertise on it. And uh, this is stuff we'll be talking about for a long time. Uh, Richard Zuba, the Glenn Gariff Group, and that's gonna do it for us this morning. Thanks so much for being here. Meet the Press coming up next. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time on Flashpoint.